Good morning and welcome everyone. My name is Ashley Carruthers. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I serve as the LGBTQ plus liaison at the Department of Veterans Affairs Center for Minority Veterans. I am thrilled to have you all here, whether in person or virtually, to commemorate Transgender Day of Visibility through the amazing partnership between CMV and Pride VA, which is the LGBTQ plus employee research group here at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Every year on March 31st, the world comes together to honor and recognize the transgender community. This day is not only about celebrating the incredible lives and contributions of the transgender individuals, but also shedding light on the challenges, injustices, and inequalities they still face to this day. The Center for Minority Veterans and Pride VA is proud to stand together in solidarity and celebrate our transgender veterans, families, caregivers, and survivors. I want to take this moment to thank the folks that were vital to making today possible, our media services team, the production team, building maintenance, protocol, and our amazing security staff downstairs. Thank you. To our veterans, I want to speak directly to you for a moment, if I may. I extend my deepest gratitude for your service, bravery, and sacrifices. Your dedication to this nation has not gone unnoticed, we see you, and we thank you, and we celebrate you. Visibility is crucial. It has the power to dismantle hate, challenge ignorance, and ultimately save lives. Lives like young Next Benedict and Alex Franco, and countless many others whose stories remind us why visibility matters. Let's continue to amplify those voices that are continually unheard. Let's amplify the voices of those who inspire us and pave the way for a more inclusive and accepting society. Thank you for joining us as we honor the resilience and strength of our transgender veteran community. Together through hard work, policy reform, and events like this today, we can make a difference. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing two of my favorite people on this planet the Executive Director for the Center for Minority Veterans, Mr. James Albino. Mr. Albino is a proud Navy veteran who serves as the Principal Advisor to the Secretary of Veterans Affairs on the adoption and implementation of policies and programs that affect veterans who are minorities and underserved. Mr. Albino previously served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs at the VA. Prior to the VA, Mr. Albino served as the Executive Director of the President's Task Force on Puerto Rico in the White House. Mr. Albino is one of the fiercest advocates that I know, and I am continually proud and honored to stand by his side. Admiral Rachel Levine serves as the 17th Assistant Secretary for Health for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, also known as HHS, and the head of the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. She fights every day to improve the health and well-being of all Americans. She's working to help our nation overcome the COVID-19 pandemic and build a stronger foundation for a healthier future, one in which every American can attain their full health potential. Admiral Levine's storied career, first as a physician in academic medicine focused on the intersection between mental and physical health, treating children, adolescents, and young adults. Then as Pennsylvania's Physician General, and later as Pennsylvania's Secretary of Health, she addressed COVID-19, the opioid crisis, behavioral health, and other public health challenges. Welcome, Admiral. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for that, Ashley. Um, thank you, Admiral. Um, thank you for the free pediatric advice. Absolutely. I, I, I am a bit um, nervous. I've never been this close to that much gold since I was in the Navy, <laughs> so I'm, I'm a little nervous. Um, I have a couple questions for you. Sure. Uh, Ashley covered a, a, a little bit of your bio, but one of the things that st stuck out to me is your experience at Harvard and Tulane and uh, especially in Mount Sinai during the HIV-AIDS 
crisis, right. Thank you. Um, as well as, uh, of course, p uh, pediatric medicine, and then your work in Pennsylvania. So we covered a little bit of that, but is there a couple of items about that experience that you would, you would want to share with us? Sure. So um, thank you. I'm really very pleased to be here. Um, it, it's a tremendous honor. Um, so uh, as you said, I, I went to Harvard College uh, many years ago, and, and it was uh, a fantastic experience academically, very rewarding and challenging. And then uh, went to Tulane Medical School uh, in New Orleans, Louisiana, very different than Cambridge and Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, and at Tulane, I fell in love with the field of pediatrics and taking care of children, and then particularly this new subspecialty of pediatrics at that time um, of adolescent medicine, taking care of teenagers and, and young adults. Uh, and there was a professor at Tulane, uh, Dr. Tomas, who uh, specialized in adolescent medicine and really inspired me about that. Um, so when I left uh, Tulane, my goal was to do a internship and residency and then fellowship in pediatrics and adolescent medicine. So I went to Mount Sinai in New York City in Manhattan, and that's exactly what I did. I did my internship, my residency, my chief residency, and then a fellowship in adolescent medicine. Um, so I started that program at Mount Sinai Hospital in Manhattan in 1983. And at that time, of course, was just the beginnings of the HIV AIDS crisis, um, but we didn't know what was causing these infections. Now in pediatrics, what we first saw were newborns and very young infants with opportunistic infections, infections that you wouldn't usually see. Uh, and at the same time, their mothers had these infections, um, sometimes their fathers, and they all tragically passed away. Um, then we started to see teenagers and young adults with the same type of infections, and they passed away. And then over the next several years, it was, um, it was found out that the HIV virus was causing this acquired immune deficiency. Um, and uh, so we knew more about it, um, you know, more every year, but we still saw all these patients um, and that um, had HIV AIDS, and they all died. Uh, and I had friends and colleagues in Manhattan that also died. Um, by the late 80s and the early 90s, we had the development of AZT, um, but that proved to be ineffective. And so still, it was extremely um, emotionally and physically challenging. Um, now, you know, we have what I at that time would have considered medical miracles. You know, we have PrEP. We have um, pre-exposure prophylaxis that you can take this medicine either orally or by injection and uh, if you're at risk you will not contract HIV. We have um, uh, antiretroviral therapy or ART where someone becomes can become undetectable, the HIV virus is undetectable and it is then untransmittable. U equals U. At that time I would have considered those medical Miracles, And we have, you know, the work of the NIH and other specialists in the United States and throughout the world, hopefully more medical miracles to come. But we still struggle to get those medical miracles to the people who need them most. And so that's what we're concentrating on with the Ending the HIV Epidemic initiative um, that we're working on at HHS, and we collaborate with the VA all the time on this. And so I was there at the beginning of the HIV AIDS crisis and I am committed to be there at the end mm -hmm. of the HIV AIDS crisis. Thank you for that. Thank, we, we thank you for that. That's incredible work. If I may, I just want to follow up question before I get to my burning question. Uh, when talking about prevention for, for this disease, a lot of folks don't really understand, and a lot of our women veterans don't understand, that PrEP is also for them too. Can you speak right. about that? Well, PrEP is for anyone who might be at risk of contracting HIV. And, and what we, we, we have to understand is there is a syndemic, which means many different things coming together, um, which is uh, the risk of HIV, the risk of hepatitis, Right now, actually, the risk of syphilis, which we're seeing a resurgence of syphilis in the country, and substance use and use of opioids and methamphetamine, um, uh, which can also lead, of course, to overdose. And so they are all wrapped up together. And so um, uh, we see um, you know, many people at risk of HIV, and we can prevent this disease. We can prevent, and prevention is treatment, mm -hmm. and treatment is prevention. It's two sides of the same coin. And so with PrEP and with ART and U equals U, 
we can conquer this disease so that there are no more new cases of HIV. But we all have to work together and we have to access communities that we haven't otherwise been able to, 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 to access. And that includes, of course, veterans. Thank you for that, I appreciate that. So th my burning question that I've yes. been wanting to ask you for many moons now. In 2021, you were sworn in and became the first, but certainly not the last, because I feel that there's some folks in here that could fill this role as well, out transgender four-star officer in the country's eight uniform services. Can you walk us through that moment, sure. getting that phone call and what that was like for you? So there are two steps to that, um, so thank you. The, the first was um, being um, uh, asked to, uh, to be the Assistant Secretary for Health. Um, actually, I got that, uh, in, um, that query in January of 2021 by text. So I, 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 and it was late. It was about 9, 30, 10 o'clock, so of course I was sleeping. And so I got this text, would you be interested in a position in the Biden administration? And the next morning I was like, well, yeah. Um, and, and so that led to um, my being nominated by the president to be the assistant secretary for health at HHS uh, and my interesting confirmation hearing, uh, and then my approval by uh, um, a confirmation by the Senate with a bipartisan vote to that position. Now, with that position comes the opportunity to, uh, to, to become a member of the Public Health Service Commission Corps, the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps, which is one of our, as you said, eight uniformed services. So we're not a member of the armed services or the military. I report to the Secretary of HHS. Um, but it has a storied history since 1798, so we've been around a long time. Uh, and um, I have the opportunity to assume my commission and to amazingly become a four-star admiral in the Public Health Service Commission Corps. So that is an unusual position to be. So I have been in medicine for 40 years, but I have not been in uniform for 40 years. And so uh, the Surgeon General and I, it is just a tremendous opportunity. And I knew that when I assumed the position of Assistant Secretary that this is what I wanted to do and have become um, absolutely committed to our almost 5,600 uh, uniformed medical and public health officers that serve throughout the country and throughout the world. We are the only uniformed public health service in the world. So an amazing honor and privilege. Thank you. Um, we have so much in common, Admiral. Um, I joined the Obama administration in the Office of National AIDS Policy, the first one that was stood up. And I, too, was walking down 16th Street and got a text, hey, can you join us to take this job there and you go. Uh, report on Monday? <laughs> 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 and so I was standing in the corner of a 16th, and, I think, in P, and just dancing up and down. And people were looking at me like, what's wrong with this guy? <laughs> but I was happy to, that that happened. Yes. So. Um, and, and one of the things I learned in that is that uh, representation matters. It does. Being at the table matters. It does. Uh, seeing people that look like you matters. I have my son here with me today. Yes. And, and uh, um, you know, him seeing you, seeing us matters. So how, what do you want to show the people that are looking at you today, for their, the young people that are looking at you today for their careers, who inspired you and who inspires you now? So um, I think you're entirely correct, is that representation is, is very important. And I feel that um, privilege and responsibility um, in terms of representation for the broader LGBTQI plus community as well as the, uh, the transgender community to, uh, to get, my, my thought is that I need to give back, that I have had a tremendous opportunities, I have had privilege. Um, and so the way I think of that is, is to give back and to uh, work and advocate for health equity broadly and for health equity for the LGBTQI plus community. Um, and that is fundamental to our secretary, Secretary Javier Becerra. Um, another thought is that you, you never really know where things, where life will take you. So, you know, I was very ensconced in academic medicine. So I was um, at the Penn State College of Medicine. I was a professor of pediatrics and psychiatry, uh, division chief, vice chair. And so, you know, what did I think would my career 
career path would be is that if you're a vice chair, maybe you become a chair, um, or maybe you become an associate dean, but all within the, 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 um, uh, the, 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 con the confines or within a academic medicine. But then I had this unique opportunity to become the uh, physician general and then the Secretary of Health of Pennsylvania. Um, and um, many people advised me not to take that. Uh, that it was, you know, you spent your life in academic medicine, why would you leave? But I felt it was just a tremendous opportunity, so that would not come around again. So I jumped and, and did that, and then, uh, you know, it, my, at that time, my mother was about um, 93 years old. Um, she's since passed, but, but she, at that time, you know, she said, you're, you know, honey, you're the Secretary of Health of Pennsylvania. You know, that could lead to something. <laughs> And I thought, you know, I, I thought it was something, <laughs> but, you know, uh, but, but you know what? My mother was always right, and, um, and it did lead to something. It led to this position. Um, one person who I admire greatly um, and was a real role model um, from a diversity perspective was um, uh, a physician named Dr. Angela Diaz. So Dr. Angela Diaz, when I started Mount Sinai as an intern, she was a resident. And when, um, when, when I started as a resident, she was a fellow in adolescent medicine. Uh, and then I became a fellow and she was an attending in adolescent mm -hmm. medicine. So she was always like three or four years ahead of me. But she grew up um, in Spanish Harlem. She grew up in that area of, uh, of uh, and was a patient at the Adolescent Health Center at Mount Sinai. Wow. And then she, um, she, became, she uh, went through you know, medical school and residency and all that process, and then she ran the Adolescent Health Center, and now she's a, uh, a vice dean at Mount Sinai. And so um, you know, she has always demonstrated that representation matters and um, has been quite a mentor to me through, through various aspects of my career. She's also a White House fellow at one point. So that's who I would name. Thank you for that. You know, uh, thinking about visibility and things mattering, you know, I'm the L in the equation. And uh, growing up, I didn't see too many folks that looked like me. Uh, you know, I had Ellen on TV, and that's how I figured, you know, and then I went to school in the encyclopedia, and I'm like, what's a lesbian? You know, and trying to figure that out and figure out who I was, and then joining the military and hiding who I was, but then eventually seeing other folks that looked like me. And then, you know, we got, had the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And so I, I know my privilege, you know, as a white woman, and I, I hope everybody knows, because a lot of the folks in this room today and, and online that are joining us virtually, I've served with these folks. And so it's so important that we're in the room, and as James said, having a seat at the table to talk about uh, the things that matter most. And a lot of us have different paths and how we come to determine, you know, what is our path in life. And for me, it was a decision of you either go to, you know, the University of Milwaukee and drink a lot and have a, a good life there, or you join the military and, and do the, the latter as well. So I, I joined the military. <laughs> and I was just wondering, you know, for you as a physician, that's a lot of years of schooling that I could never do. And I'm just wondering, is there a moment in your life where you said, I'm going to be a doctor, I'm going to yes. be a physician. So um, uh, we all have a winding course, as you, as you said. So <clears throat> there was a time when I, was, um, when I was young, maybe about 14 or 15, that maybe I would do theater. I would do theater. <clears throat> and I talked to my parents, and they said, honey, you know, they, now my mother, my father, my uncle, my sister, my cousin, my niece, and now my son are attorneys. So there is a lawyer gene someplace. And I went to my parents and said, you know what, I, I think I might like to go into theater. And they said, you know, you can do anything you want. You, could, you don't have to go to law school. You could go to medical school. <laughs> um, or, or, you know what, you could go to business school. Law school, medical school, business school, so whatever. Um, and so um, I, I, I took that under advisement. And it's not why I went to medical school, but I started to look at other things. I did not want to go to law school. And so um, I, when I took biology in, at, uh, in high school, it was like, oh, I really liked that. And then I actually worked at a, a, a medical research laboratory at Boston University School of Medicine for a number of different summers, and I really liked that. And so I decided that when I went to Harvard that I would um, study biology, and then gradually that I, would go to, that I would go to medical school. I have to say that I think for me it, it worked out very, very well, um, and I was very fortunate. And 
have privilege. So I, I have always been tremendously gratified by my medical career. So all I did in academic medicine was try to help people, right? So I would see children and teenagers and their families and try to help them. I would teach students and residents and others about how to do that. I would do clinical research about how to do that better, and then develop programs in terms of administration about how to, how to organize that and, 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 and organize the different um, programs and offices to, to do that. And then I had this opportunity to do it from a broader public health brush, with a broader public health perspective, first in Pennsylvania and now here. What could be more rewarding? Thank you for that. S s some folks would argue that practicing law is theater. <laughs> um, some people would argue that these jobs are theater. <laughs> um, just last night, uh, I was talking to my neighbor uh, who's a bombardier, and he's in the Air Force, and he's coming to the end of his career, and he's thinking about does he stay in for the next 10 years and make 30, or does he leave at 20? And he's just... Uh, grappling with that concept. He's got a small, a young, very young girl yeah. that he'd want to spend more time with, and this takes him away from, from that environment. And I tried to give him some advice. I hope he's watching. Um, but as, as many uh, active duty members are thinking about hanging up their boots, how did you handle that, and what advice would you give uh, to folks for that? Well, the, the, the biggest analogy that I can make is what I mentioned before, is leaving academic medicine because that had been sort of my goal. Um, and um, I had been, achieved that goal, and then had this amazing opportunity to become the physician general of, of Pennsylvania, uh, which is sort of equivalent to the surgeon general, but for Pennsylvania. Um, and it really just fell from the sky. Um, I was asked to be the co-chair of the Transitions Committee for Health. A lot of people asked me why I was asked to be the head of the Transitions Committee, and I, I think it's because they knew I specialized in transitions. <laughs> Um, so, um, and, uh, you know, all the, all the different departments have a transition committee. They do that in the federal government. And then at the end of that report, they said, well, would you like a position in the administration? And it was like, well, yeah. And, yeah. and so, but people advised me not to do that, that it was too big of a career shift and why would you do that? But again, I, I, whatever you think of the universe, you know, whether you think it, it was God's will or karma or just the flow of the universe, it felt like this is what I should do. I should take this opportunity, and um, uh, and I did, and then again that led to Secretary of Health, and that led to to this position. So you you never really know um, where your life is going to take you. Um, there's a, 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 a old science fiction book um, by Douglas Adams, you know, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and I don't know if people only my age will know that book, and um, and and it, one of the quotes, I won't get it exactly right, is, is, you know, I might not have gone where I intended to go, but I've ended up where I, I should have, I intended to be, meaning I, I ended up in the right place. Yeah. Um, and uh, you never know what that is, and so I would be open to new opportunities. Um, and no one can tell you w whether to stay or to go, no matter what the opportunities are. You have to weigh it within yourself and, and within your family and the universe and decide I'm going to try that. And so that would be the best advice I could give to someone. Um, the, the other would be um, from another author, uh, Joseph Campbell, who was uh, in comparative religion um, uh, in, in New York City, um, who said, follow your bliss, meaning try to judge what will make you happy and what's most fulfilling, and then do that. So that would be my best advice. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm going to ask a follow-up to that question. We've got a lot of VA employees, especially in the medical field, uh, doing various jobs. And a lot of them I've, I've heard from recently, they're thinking about taking a leap of faith and transitioning to a different role, whether that's going back to school. Uh, but some of them, you know, they've been in the medical field. You know, some are CNAs who want to become RNs, but they're, they're struggling with the concept because they need to go back to school, then they might lose their seniority. Mm. And would you have any advice for them? Um, the, the same advice I just gave, in, in that I can't tell them, I don't know them, I don't know their lives, and tell them which is the best path for them. But I would, I would, you know, I would think about it, and think about um, the challenges and opportunities of e each path, um, how that impacts them personally, but of course their family, um, and, and, and then, 
in the end, it's a subjective decision. I mean, you can write down the pluses and the minuses and stuff, but in the end, you kind of weigh it in, in your mind and in your heart, and you decide, I'm going to do this. And so for some people, it might be better to stay, and for other people, it's ready to jump. I jumped. I love that. Thank you for that. Within the last few years, we've seen diversity, equity, and inclusion kind of at the forefront of the stage and in many respects under attack. Um, when you look at the barriers uh, for transgender individuals from achieving full equality yeah. and recognition, what, what comes to mind as we're stepping sure. into this new space of where everything is? So it's become attack? very challenging. You know, I am a firm believer, advocate, supporter of diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, or DEIA. Now, DEIA has become under attack for various political and ideological purposes, but, um, but I am um, and remain and will remain a, a, a tremendous supporter. Um, I, I think diversity is so important in every organization. So whether that is a governmental department, whether it's, a, uh, whether it's in academics, whether it is in business, whether it is in hospitals and whatever field, because it, it brings different perspectives um, and, and it brings such a, um, um, a wonderful tapestry um, uh, of diversity that we have in our nation, and I mean diversity from every single aspect that you could think of diversity, including sexual and gender minorities, but not, not just those, a every different possibility. It just makes a more vibrant place and a more successful place if you have those diversity of, of experiences um, and that diversity of opinions. Um, and so I think that that's, that's absolutely critically important, uh, equity, inclusion, um, and accessibility. And so I think that we need to continue to, uh, to demonstrate that and to support that despite um, the attacks um, upon those concepts. Thank you. Um, I was talking to Gene a few minutes ago um, about a world where he was commenting that we're 98% exactly the same, similar. But we focus on that two, 3% difference. And um, the notion that, and he asked, do you see the possibility of change? And when I first walked into the White House for working on HIV AIDS, I had come from Puerto Rico, a hospice, and now you're talking about folks flying kites and because they're taking X medicine and that's working and they're living, and it's not that environment in the late 80s. I saw change, right? I, I witnessed change. I happened to be benefit from being in the front lines of change. Do you see, what role do advocates have in contributing to sure. that change? So I think that um, advocates, um, uh, with, so for example, within the LGBTQI plus community and our allies, which are critically important, are, are essential to that continued progress. And I think that it is, um, uh, it is so important to have advocates uh, from within government and advocates um, uh, outside of government, and I think that we work synergistically together. Um, and I'm a positive and optimistic person. You might have guessed that, I don't know, it's <laughs> subtle. Um, but, and I think that, that diversity, equity, and inclusion, and accessibility for all communities, including our LGBTQI plus community, um, will be successful. I, I think that the wheel will turn on the attacks that we are facing now, um, and that and that you know we will continue to grow and flourish as a and thrive as a nation and as a society. There are always going to be challenges. Challenges, the other side of challenges are opportunities. And so I don't uh, discount the, the um, and I'm very realistic about the challenges facing many in our community, particularly, particularly transgender and non-binary youth in many states across the country, uh, their families who are suffering with them, and their providers, medical and psychological providers, many at, for example, at our nation's fantastic children's hospital. Remember, I spent my whole, most of my career at children's hospitals. Um, and so I think that 
Um, those challenges exist, and I'm very realistic about them. I go around the country and I see them all every with every trip, um, and I'm very aware of their of their of their suffering and the and the difficulties they're having. But I still remain positive and optimistic that we will all together, working together as one, overcome those challenges, and our society will continue to thrive. Thank you for that. Thanks, Gene. Good question. Um, uh, you know, I have. I have a, my, get my health care here at the D.C. Uh, Medical Center, VA Medical Center, and I've had the same uh, primary care physician for about 20 years, and God bless him. He's amazing. Um, but I think that I, I've come to him for a number of reasons, mostly health reasons, but he's also taken the time to talk to me about having kids, all of that. And what role do you think a health care professional has in advising transgender uh, right, particularly youth and e equality. Absolutely critical role, um, and uh, that's what I did in pediatrics and adolescent medicine. I mean, I saw um, challenged youth and teens and young adults um, from many different perspectives, including LGBTQI plus youth and their families. And I think that physicians, whether it's for pediatrics or adolescents or for adults, play a critical role, and not just physicians, healthcare providers and, and mental health providers also. So I've always worked with nurse practitioners, with physician's assistants, with nurses, with dietitians, with psychologists, with psychiatrists, and many more. And I think that we all have to work as a team, and I think that we have to support um, LGBTQI plus individuals and their families, and particularly right now, um, uh, transgender youth and their families and their providers. And I think that the role of those medical providers is critical. You know, there's a study from the Trevor Project that for a vulnerable LGBTQI plus youth, that one supportive adult, one supportive adult can make all the difference in their mental health and the risk of depression and suicide. One supportive adult. Now, you might like to think that that would be one of their parents or their family, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's their doctor or their nurse. Maybe it's their teacher, which makes the quote unquote don't say gay bills so, um, so damaging because it takes away the opportunity for that young person to speak to their teacher or their coach at school. Maybe it's their faith leader. But so many different opportunities for that one supportive adult to make all the difference. And so that very well might be uh, one of their medical providers who needs to support them. And that's why we need uh, evidence-based, right. evidence-based standard of care transgender medicine for youth and adults. It is a, um, has a rich database of, of medical studies. Um, there's a standard of care by WPATH, the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, updated in 2022. Uh, I was there in Montreal uh, when they uh, updated it. Um, uh, it's different than the 2011 standards of care. Well, any medical standard of care from 2011 has evolved to 2022. So things don't stay static in medicine. We all we need more research. We need better we always need better treatments and care so we can refine that, and that research is critically important, whether it's you know, sponsored by the NIH or in the United States or other places. Um, but transgender medicine is medical care. Transgender medicine is mental health care, and it can be literally suicide prevention care. For youth, it's often provided at those children's hospitals, whether it is Mount Sinai, whether it is Penn State, whether it is uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and so other many other places that I've been um, throughout the country, um, and by the same pediatricians that see other children. So if you have a child with diabetes, you might see the pediatric endocrinologist. If you have a child with a mental health condition, you might see the child psychiatrist or psychologist. Well, it's the same people that, the trend, that someone, a youth who has gender issues would be going to see. So you would want to see the gender specialists, perhaps at the children's hospital, not necessarily your state legislator. Absolutely. <laughs> Speaking of seeking medical help, you know, at VA, we've got a tremendous amount of really amazing medical professionals across the nation. And they're all doing amazing work for us. But some of them are, are still questioning, you know, how can I best advocate for my veterans, especially those that are transgender and gender reverse, non-binary? What would you, you know, what advice, if you sure. could, 
give those medical professionals? So first, I would like to thank all of those medical professionals who work at the VA, the doctors, the nurses, the nurse practitioners, the physical therapists, um, psychiatrists, psychologists, and the full range of physical and mental health professionals um, from all those different fields who serve our veterans. I, I think that, that they, they, they deserve our, our, our praise and our thanks. Um, I think that it is important uh, to be open to all forms of diversity, including sexual and gender minorities, um, and to educate yourself about, um, uh, about the medical care for LGBTQI plus people, not just transgender and non-binary people, but the full range of our rainbow family, um, and the medical needs that they have because they're different. Um, uh, the medical needs of, of, of gay and bisexual men um, have specific medical needs. For, for lesbian women have met specific medical needs. For tra transgender and non-binary people, uh, intersex the community, they all have specific medical and mental health needs, and so it's important for them to be up to date and to educate. Now, not everyone is going to, for example, practice transgender medicine. Not everybody is a cardiothoracic surgeon either. You don't want me doing your surgery. <laughs> I can't see, and I'm a klutz, so you don't want me doing your neurosurgery. And so not everyone is going to practice every aspect of medicine, but they should be open to that um, and, and with appropriate referrals. But it's important to, for them to be educated and know when to refer and to be completely open and to learn the language and, for example, how to ask if someone might be gay or, um, or trans or anyone else, on, and again, in our, in our rainbow family spectrum, um, and how to ask and how to talk about it, um, to know what resources are available, and then to make appropriate referrals when they don't know what to do, um, and to know what they don't know. So um, we need to do a better job um, uh, with all medical and public health and mental health professionals in terms of teaching that in our schools as well. So that's what I would ask for the great people who serve at the VA. Thank you for that. And you know, we spoke a little bit earlier this morning about our veterans and them seeking care and asking you know, for help. For, for their medical providers. We have a lot of veterans that will, you know, they'll sit in the parking lot, they're anxious, they're nervous about going into the facility, they're nervous about confronting, you know, their medical providers, and they don't know how to open up. And then we have some folks that want to open up, but they also don't understand, and this might be, you know, older generations of veterans that served, you know, pre Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and during yeah. Don't Ask, Don't Tell, when it was, perceived that it was not okay to be who you are. And so they're really nervous about opening up because they view you know, their experience at DOD and VA as one and the same, and yeah. we're separate. But they also don't understand you know, the importance of coming out to your provider and what that can do for, from a whole health perspective. Can you talk sure. about that? Because a lot of veterans just don't understand. Well, I, I think it is critically important for, um, for all patients to be open with their medical providers. And that includes um, our, um, our uh, uh, veterans at the VA, um, as well as for all the people currently serving at the DOD. And it really is true in the private sector as well, is that your medical provider can't take care of you um, the best if they don't know who you are, because that might determine, um, from, from in terms of uh, sex and gender, because that would determine what care you might need. Um, and so I think it is important for it to be open, but I think it is incumbent upon the medical provider and the, the clinic where they work and the office where they work to uh, do everything they possibly can to make people um, comfortable in terms of being open about who they about who they are. So, you know, for example, just having, you know, um, a small uh, pride flag sticker, you know, on, uh, um, on, the, on the wall or, or on, you know, at the, when you enter, the enter would be fine. Um, just te teaching, for example, people at the front desk, don't assume people's um, name and what name they use, don't assume what their gender is. Um, when you're asking questions, you know, I mean, if you say, well, tell me about your, your you know, um, you, are you married, do you have a wife? You know, well, then you just shut off a whole bunch of mm -hmm. questions. So there are very well established ways to, to, to medically inquire in, during your history and physical examination about um, sex and gender. Mm -hmm. um, and so they should learn, healthcare providers need to learn that, and the more comfortable they are, 
the more comfortable the patients will be, the more comfortable the veteran would be in terms of being, in terms of being open. And if not at the first visit, then maybe at, at another visit. But I think the onus is on the medical providers to create that, that welcoming space for people to be open and then get the medical care that they need and deserve. Mm -hmm. And I also talked to you earlier about some of our veterans that will clam up. You know, they're in yeah. that situation, just as you said, they, they go to the front desk staff, they're checking in for their appointment, whether it be dental, an eye exam, what, what have you. And that individual does just that. They assume that right. person's gender. What advice would you give for that, that veteran to kind of like get get out of that headspace well, and, and, and yeah. try to advocate for themselves. Well, I, again, I think that, that, they, that you have to, they have to trust. To be able to do that and to express who you are, you have to trust that the other person is going to treat you with respect. Um, trust is earned. And so I think, again, it's incumbent upon the, cl the provider, but not just the provider, the clinic, the person at the front desk, the mm -hmm. forms, uh, to, to, to create that that welcoming space so that eventually the person can do that. Um, and you need to ask questions in a, you know, in, in a, in a non-judgmental way. Um, so uh, without making those assumptions. Um, and it is in creating that, again, that space for the person to be able to to come out and and to talk to you as the medical provider and and so I think that there are again we don't have to reinvent the wheel there are well established ways to do that I ask everyone the same questions so tell me you know um, uh, you know um, I, I, I you know in terms of who you have personal relationships with are they men women or both or just tell me about yourself I mean there are ways to do that. For, for adolescents, and there are ways to do that for adults, and there are ways to do that within the VA, and um, it is really the responsibility of our great medical providers to do that. Thank you for that. James, do you have any other questions? Sure, uh, I'm gonna go off script if you will allow me, sure. Ashley. Uh -oh. Um, oh, off script. <laughs> yep, uh, but it won't be. That's okay. Um, so many of us are trained to be running into the burning building uh, where most people are running out, and whether that's in our military careers or in medicine that's or true. in crises. I mean, uh, you were in Pennsylvania during the COVID Correct. years, um, and then in, in Mount Sinai, rough neighborhood, in, in, uh, during the AIDS crisis, you know, I, I had similar experiences. W what do you say to those people, and, and maybe this is, psych this is the free psychology yeah, lesson, sure. of that, that you need to at some point stop yeah, and take care of yourself. Right, um, it's not constantly running into f burning buildings. Um, you have to stop and take care of yourself. And I have a follow-up question. So sure, sure, uh, the bill will come tomorrow. <laughs> um, so you know, I, I, a couple of things. One is that what I learned in clinical medicine was how to compartmentalize. Right, and so um, so people ask me. You know, I um, I get attacked a lot. Um, for who I am and in the position I'm in and how do I cope with that and so I have developed the ability But it really came from my clinical training to compartmentalize So if I am in the pediatric emergency room and this very sick child comes in um, I can't lose it. You know, it's very emotional, you know with the family the child of you know, especially children um, and or infants and, and teenagers and I, I have to be able to learn to keep my composure, to professionally deal with what I need to deal to deal with, compartmentalize thoughts and feelings, and then to bring them out later with my family and friends and however I deal with stress and to, to deal with it. Um, and so I have learned how to do that. I think it's a very important talent. You don't have to be a doctor or a pediatrician to learn how to do that. I think it is very important to compartmentalize. I'm sure that veterans have experience with that. So if they are in a, in a, in a military situation or they've had stress in their service, I'm sure they, they have to learn to compartmentalize and to deal with it in a healthy way later. We all have to do that in, in the stresses that we have in our lives. Um, but you do have to take it out later and at some point you have to take care of yourself and you cannot take care of someone else unless you are taking care of yourself or you will be unsuccessful so you have to find ways to deal with that stress and to take care of yourself physically and mentally and and to be able to decompress 
take out whatever you've put away and to be able to cope with it. And if you don't, then it really does lead to physical and mental health problems. So the metaphor that I use is the eye of the hurricane. So think of our, our world, no matter what, where we are, as the hurricane, and it's stressful, uh, particularly now particularly during the pandemic, coming out of the pandemic, particularly with the stresses that we have with, with media and social media and you know, in our country and in our world. It's very stressful. Um, and that might be personal stress, job stress, existential stress about things. And so it is that hurricane. But in the eye of the hurricane, it is calm. It is peaceful. And so you have to find your center and your composure, and we all have to do this in various ways. Now, there are a million different ways to do that, and it's the personal to you. So it might be music, it might be art, it might be athletics, it might be your family, it might be, um, uh, it, it might be through meditation, maybe it's yoga or tai chi, or maybe it's your faith. Or, you know, I, there's, there's so many different ways that it might be that you can find your center and then be able to deal with the stresses that life presents. Um, so that's what I always recommend. And I think that it's incumbent upon us to teach our kids that same way because, I mean, um, it, it, everybody has stressful lives. And so we all have to find that center. And so that's my thoughts about that. You, you um, thank you for that. Um, Earlier, you mentioned the universe or divine or some entity. I'm a big advocate of or supporter of synchronicity and synchronicity in the shape that it's the, the events you cause to happen that create the synchronicity in your life. Mm -hmm. I, the last thing I expected in my life when I was this young was sitting next to you um, too many years later. Um, but um, I'm really happy that this has happened. Uh, have you had that experience here in your life, and, sure. and how has it shaped your so, career? So um, I was raised Jewish uh, by family. Um, uh, like many intellectual Jewish people, I studied Zen Buddhism um, and meditation. Uh, that's a common, a, a common thing for, for, for intellectual Jewish people to do. Um, and so I, I consider myself a very spiritual person. Um, I am not... Um, a, a tremendously religiously observant person in terms of, of uh, dogma or ritual, um, but a very spiritual person. And again, you know, I'm open to different ways that you think about the universe, um, but I do believe that there is meaning and connection in our lives. Thank you for that. That's exactly how I, I see it. Um, actually, and I have asked you a, a whole host of questions. Um, I think we covered a lot of territory. Are there, are there things that you want to share that we haven't touched? I'm sure there are. Um, and I'd like to open that up for, for well, you to... Well, you know, I, I want to come back to, um, to optimism and hope for the future. I, I think that it is critically important that um, as a country, as a society, uh, that we have um, optimism and, and hope for our future with realism for the challenges that we face and then the optimism that we can overcome those. The president talks about that all the time. Um, and the vice president talks about that all the time. And so I, I firmly believe that, that um, uh, in America, in our nation, that we all ha serve and have served, um, and, that, uh, and that our future is bright. Um, and I think that that is true for our, our LGBTQI plus community. We have a strong and resilient community. We have a community that fights hate with love. And I think that, that that love, that that spirit that we have, um, will carry forth, and that we will be that we will be able to live in our country um, fully equal, fully free, and express um, who we who we are and who we love. And so I firmly believe that, and that's what I want to transmit to the audience. Thank you for that. Um, can I ask one more question? Absolutely. Um, I'm a big Javier Becerra fan. Yes. Um, I've worked with him on so many different times in the past. Uh, I saw him recently at an event. He's just a, a, an endearing 
genuine human being in my mind. What's it like to work for him? Absolutely fantastic. As you said, he is tremendously generous, um, genuine, compassionate, um, uh, and relays that in his work with the department. Um, in, in our department, health equity is foundational. It is fundamental to everything that we're doing. So for every grant, for every notice of funding, for every, every program, for every regulation, we have to, we include health equity. It's not like on Friday afternoons, oh, we've got to think about health equity. It's every day. And, and he has instilled that um, in us, in his leadership. The other thing he says every day uh, when he talks to us is to, is to not do mild, what he calls don't do mild, to think boldly and to, th <laughs> and to, and to act boldly. Um, in terms of our, our, our policies and our procedures and in terms of our work. Um, and again, you know, for, for us here and for you at the VA, what could be more rewarding? Because all we are doing is helping people. And so uh, Secretary Brasier is a wonderful leader for us to help people at HHS. Thank you. Thank, do you have anything else to? I just, I just want to say thank you for this tremendous opportunity. And to everyone that's in the room, those that are joining us uh, live on via YouTube channel, I Andy especially, <laughs> this is what's possible and visibility matters and it's so important to have you here today and, and just thank each and every one of you for everything that you do and thank you for everything that you do for us each and every day. Thank you, it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank All right, and now we're gonna take a group photo if folks wanna come on up. I think we're gonna leave some chairs here, but I'm gonna turn it over to Jean to orchestrate.